lovies, it's David McGillivray here and this is another edition of Little Did You Know. It's a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting and I hope you agree. Uh, today on a glorious uh, summer's day we're here in my uh, front room uh, in West London. Uh, they are doing a loft conversion next door so you may hear some crashing and indeed uh, drilling. You can't miss it uh, but let's hope they're on a lunch break. My guest this week is uh, one of the most remarkable I've had on this show. By that I mean he's had the most remarkable life of anyone since the beginning of this series. Um, he said himself uh, that for 51 years he assumed he was an only child and this year he discovered he's got two sisters. He's also got a book out. It was launched yesterday. And in addition to that, he's co-directing a film right now about the notorious and iconic Scala Cinema here in London. Will you please say hello to the very remarkable Ali Catterall. Hello, world. Hello, lovey. Now... Uh, let's briefly talk um, about your uh, book because we're going to come back to this subject uh, later. Tell me, um, well, first of all, I think hold it up so that we can see it. It's uh, what we used to call a pocket-sized book. It's called Kindness. Why is the time right for a book about kindness? I think we're living in an extraordinary age, don't you? I think we're living in an age which is of extremes, I think, it would be fair to say. Um, it's very easy, I think, to slip into a kind of anguish or depression everywhere you look these days, particularly on social media. Um, and I guess the feeling is that we're living in, obviously, by dint of, of recent events, through big history anyway. Uh, but I think on top of that, there's a feeling that this uh, pernicious culture war, for one thing, has completely poisoned the discourse has seeped into every hairline crack of of our lives and, and politics and culture um and is and you know we're governed by extremely bloviating you know rudderless kind of leadership what's that word again bloviate okay i've never come across it so please tell me what it means i guess it means a kind of buffoonish buster really i'm going um, to use full of, it full of sound and fury and signifying not a lot and we know who we're talking about we do. Mm. many well, many people it's quite a roll call there isn't there um, um, so I think in, in such an environment, I think it's a it's a perfect time to um, to talk, have a serious conversation, or not so serious. I mean, this isn't Alain de Botton, let's face it, although it isn't a piece of fluff either. It's a bit of a Trojan horse, this thing, because it looks very much like a gift book. It's beautifully designed by a friend of mine called Tony Lyons, who works under the moniker of Estuary English, um, award-winning guy, who um, has done this beautiful thing. And on the surface, it looks like your typical kind of wellness kind of gift book. However, it's not. It's properly written, if you like, uh, by myself and Kitty Collins. Um, it's, I only agreed to write or co-write it, in, 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 as I said to her, um, if it didn't have a whiff of patchouli about it, if you see what I'm saying. I do, and it's 52 stories inspired by kindness. We're going to come back to that uh, uh, in the not too uh, distant future. Possibly a lot of the chat will be on uh, Patreon, and uh, you'll know if you're a subscriber that you can join us there after the show. You'll find us waiting for you. If you're not a subscriber, uh, here's the link. It's so easy to become one of the gang, and uh, it's uh, well worth it as well. Um, Ali, as I mentioned earlier, you're also uh, co-directing a film right now about uh, the Scala Cinema. Now, for the benefit of those who never had the pleasure, in a nutshell, what was the Scala? The Scala Cinema was, without doubt, without question, the world's most legendary, infamous and influential cinema there ever was. Why? Uh, well, for several reasons. If I tell you it was one of John Waters' favourite cinemas, that might give you a clue. It was a repertory cinema in the days where you had such things that showed uh, different films throughout the day and during the week. And often these films are very hard to find, or what... We're going a bit down a semantic rabbit hole if I say cult movies, but let's say for the benefit of time and argument, cult movies. Um, it 
there were things there that changed lives. The sort of audience who enter the Scala would, would go on, a great many of them, to become great directors or artists or writers or musicians. True. And how did you discover it? I discovered it. One day... We've got a prop here. We have Jane Giles, my co-director's remarkable book, which has often been said not so much a coffee table book as a coffee table. It is, it's a, it is. It's a doorstep. It's enormous. And what have you found? And I found the very first day that I ah, went ah. in October 1986. Yeah, so you'll know what you saw. And I saw Birdie by Alan Parker. Huh? On the 22nd of October 1986. Let's go. There we go. Mm -hmm. And while watching this film, I must tell you first of all how I ended up there. I was studying yes. at a school called Kingsway, then called Kingsway Princeton College, um, which is possibly most famous for the fact that the nascent Sex Pistols went there mm. um, in the early 70s. People like John Lydon and John Beverly and John Wardle and loads of other people called John. And um, I think I thought I had a sort of debt to pay to their legacy while I was there. So I was as delinquent and misbehaving as they were and, oh, eventually, and eventually got kicked out myself. But while I was there, and it was a school for, it was a further education college for people who, who had, you know, let's say sort of working class or otherwise distracted kids who hadn't particularly done very well in their exams, so they had to go here and to mop up their O and A levels. And while I was there, around the corner was this astonishing cinema that looked like a kind of ruined white Disney castle. Mm -hmm. uh, this beautiful 1920s original picture palace, this astonishing Art Deco vision in white, very muddy white back then. It's had a bit of a makeover. Um, so I went in, I thought, you know, and I loved films, I loved cinema. And I thought, well, I'll see Birdie, which is quite an unusual film to see at the Scala because it's probably one of the more mainstream offerings. I was going to say, it was, it's quite conventional. It's quite conventional. Considering the other stuff they showed. Absolutely. Did you have wild times at the Scala? I had astonishing times there. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I went till it closed, really. <sighs> um, Tell me something about the wild times you had. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think anyone who, who went there would ever forget the all-nighters. The all-nighters ah. were the stuff of legend. Mm. You would be fuelled by all kinds of different substances, mm -hmm. all sheer adrenaline. Mm. Um, and you'd usually go to sleep during the fourth film. They'd show about five films, and uh, they'd start about 11 o'clock at night and kick you out into the street at freezing and in a bit of a daze at 7am on the, on, on, on the, on the non-salubrious streets of King's Cross. It was a rough area. In those days, London's uh, King's Cross was almost a no-go area. Um, there were no uh, shops there hardly. Businesses had packed up because of the street life. <laughs> yes. Um, we're, we're talking, if anyone's seen the film Mona Lisa mm. by Neil Jordan, um, it, it's... it's Yes, that's an accurate portrayal of what King's Cross was like. I mean, it, almost undersold, actually, is an astonishing... Street drinkers, prostitutes, drug dealers. I bet mm. Neil Jordan came to the Scala. Oh, I bet he did, I yeah. bet he did. Yeah. So many people came. My goodness, I mean, Francis Bacon, David Hockney were there. Nicholas Rogue was in the audience at one stage. I mean, just everyone came there. I'm finding out more and more mm. through having co-directed this film. Yes. Exactly the width and breadth of people who went there. It's quite astonishing. How did you feel when it closed in 1993? I was, I was a bit gutted, actually. I mm. mean, uh, there wasn't, and really there isn't now, especially now, those kind of, I suppose the trendy word for it now is hub, or spaces, um, particularly those kind of transgressive spaces, because that was essentially what it was. It was an extremely LGBTQ-friendly cinema, um, it was a place where horror nuts could absolutely go out of their minds on, on the latest outrage. Um, it was a place where several different kind of tribes... You don't really get tribes these days. I think, I think we're more... Either we're more atomised or more homogenised. I can't work out which it is. But these days, presumably with, with the... You know, it's another knock-on of internet culture. You don't get those kind of extraordinary tribes that used to flock to the Scarlet. David, I'm sure, will possibly... Uh, has the line on the tribes. Don't you see that everything from... I have said in the past that it catered for OAPs, goths, 
punks, and I've forgotten all the other tribes, but I've... I, tired businessmen. Tired businessmen. How could I forget them? <laughs> because there was a lot of uh, smutty stuff shown at the Scala, including, the, oh, I've used this word before, but they were notorious, Thundercrack and Café Flesh. <laughs> I remember, um, yes, I remember Cafe Flesh very well, watching mm. that with my friends in the back row, and Santa Sangre especially. Oh, of course. With our eyes just boggling. On stalks. Yeah, yeah. I suppose <laughs> we, that's the operative word with Cafe Flesh, isn't it? Mm. Very stalky. We'd never, we'd never seen anything like that back in the 1980s. This is almost before video, folks. Um, so, at what point... Did you meet the programmer of the Scala, Jane Giles? I have to go right back to the year 2000 when I was conducting interviews uh, for a book that came out in 2001 called Your Face Here, British Cult Movies Since the 60s. Which... Oh, do you happen to have a copy? By bizarre coincidence, I'm glad. I do, David. Let's have it. It's a... right here. There it is. I remember that book. There you go. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. Well, it's the first book ever written exclusively dedicated to this subject, to British cult movies. Mm -hmm. um, so it's got films like sort of With Nat and I and Quadrophenia and The Wicker Man oh. uh, and Get Carter. This is this is lovely. Oh, look. I, I, I went through a phase of uh, whenever I'd meet anyone I'd interviewed this for previously, uh, a few years after this book was published, I'd, if it was for an interview, because I was a film journalist for a very long time, um, I would present them a copy of the book. I'd say, you helped make this, here's a copy. Uh, one of those people was Ralph Steadman, oh. who, as you can see, has done one of his very famous ink splat That's got to be signatures. worth something. My God, but he's even included, because there's a roundel, a feature of the book is a, is a roundel you yes. see on every page. So what he's done is oh, he's look. incorporated How the roundel into his own yes. signature, which I think is... One of the most beautiful and astonishing things. I gave another copy to Nick Rove at one point. Oh, wow. um, But you're getting off the subject of I, Jane uh, Giles. Anyway, Jane, yes, of course, Jane. <laughs> lovely. So Jane, who's changed my life, which I'll go into a little bit. Oh, uh, yes. Four, no less than four occasions. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I met her, I suppose, I didn't meet her at all. It was a kind of spiritual meeting. And that as the programmer of the Scala, um, she literally changed my life and set my life on a certain direction by feeding the head of this particular punter were the most extraordinary things. I bet. Uh, as programmer of the Scarlet. Um, so I interviewed her in 2000 for Your Face Here because Jane um, was the subject of a sort of... Are we, are we allowed to talk about this? We can, we can. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm just pointing out that uh, you keep tapping your foot. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, it's a nervous thing. Yeah, and that was... Right. Oh, look, I dropped, I dropped <laughs> the phone again. But this is what I was doing. But he misinterpreted... <laughs> I thought you were being friendly. I, I, I know. I thought you might be able to uh, gauge what we were talking about. Right. But no. Anyway. So, anyway. So, I, so first of all, I, I rang Jane up and I said, look, uh, as, as you were putting the dock over the terrible Clockwork Orange trial because the Scarlet got into terrible trouble for showing a Clockwork Orange, which you're not supposed to see mm. back in those days. Um, I phoned her and said, would you like to talk about that? She said, no. Um, <laughs> that was fair enough. Um, many years later, we met up um, probably about five or six years ago um, because she announced that she was writing a book about the Scarlet, the, the comprehensive book about the Scarlet. There can be no others, I imagine, ever. Um, and we had many discussions about it and she interviewed me as one of the punters. And uh, about a year later, she asked if I would like to edit this enormous thing. And uh, so I edited this. I didn't know that, Ali. Yes, I'm, I'm the book's editor, very proud editor. Um, when... And then what happened was that we were originally going to write, we met up with Channel X. This who, is um, Jonathan Ross's Jonathan company. Jonathan Ross, although he's no longer with them, mm. who are responsible for things like sort of shooting stars and Dick and Bob and Detectorists, one of my favourite programmes. And there was a discussion that we would turn her book into a sitcom. Oh. Um, yes, originally this was going to be a sitcom. <laughs> the fact that neither of us had, were comedy writers or had ever written a sitcom before didn't seem to phase us. Uh, we even called one of our characters, you'll like this, David, yes. Mrs. Sheila Keith. Oh, yes, uh, this is a reference to a character in one of my films, yes. There you go. Um, didn't happen. It didn't happen. That fell through for various reasons, you know, least of which we hadn't ever written a sitcom before. It mm. wasn't particularly great. Um, so then it was decided that, you know what, sod that, let's do what we should have done all along, 
and make the definitive documentary, feature length documentary about the Scarlet. So when did doing. you make that decision? Oof, I suppose uh, about a year and a half ago now. Ah, mm. and uh, a pretty rapid turnaround because it is now in uh, production. So, uh, time for disclosure. Um, I, I am in this film and, and that's basically, although we had met virtually, how I met Ali. So I have to show you this. The day that David turned up was actually our very first day of shooting. It was, at the Scala. And um, I came to the door to let David in. And I don't know if you can see this. Oh, but yes. Look. We came dressed identically. The terrible twins. Complete, I mean, I almost said, hello, Daddy. <laughs> I'm like his mini-me. I mean, look at that. It's, oh. And this, this was not pre-arranged, folks. It this was one of those bizarre and magical things. Well, Jane said, wear something colourful. So, <laughs> you know, that was like a red rag to a bull. Um, uh, time for more uh, disclosure. So it was in a, a break um, between shots. And, and basically, I can tell you now, Ali, I was just making conversation. And I said, um, Ali, is, your, um, is that name short for Alistair? And you replied... I replied yes and no, probably, because that's the name of my birth certificate, but I've never been called it. Um, and part of the reason why is because I'm actually Arabic. I, I, I didn't guess that. Um, uh, we're going to come back to that in uh, part two as well. Um, but uh, for, while we're on the subject of filming at the Scala, which we did, it's closed at the moment. It's now a music venue, but I gather it is going to reopen in September. I guess is it, is it I, maybe even sooner with this new bazaar? Uh, who knows what the hell is going on? <laughs> Nobody does. Um, fingers crossed. I hope so for them because they've, they've suffered a lot. You know. True, and um, they've been closed now for uh, well over a year. Mm. Um, which uh, works for us because we were able to use oh. the location intimately and it is a huge labyrinthine location so we had so many zones we could film in. But how did you cope with the famous uh, tubes on the Victoria Line which rumble underneath the cinema virtually the whole day? We've made a complete fetish of them because oh. one, of the most, one of the most glorious attractions of the Scarlet was the fact that every three minutes or four minutes you could actually hear very distinctly, the Northern Line trains rumbling. Oh, it's the Northern mean, Line. In fact, the first, in fact, the first uh, screen I went to, the aforementioned Birdie, mm. um, had a Peter Gabriel soundtrack, and uh, the, I remember, I'll never forget. There's a lovely shot of the, there's a panning shot of the camera sort of going down a kind of main street, American, to a sort of small town American sort of highway, and this fantastic kind of ambient rumble, very Peter Gabriel esque. I thought, God, isn't that mar what? Mar you know, I was sixteen. Marvelous Peter Gabriel, wonderful score. And then it happened again at a completely unrelated period of the film. And, and I thought, you, hang on, you knew. hang on, <laughs> what's going on here? You know, It's part of the Scala legend. It's part of its mythos. Yeah. Now it m and we're making a fetish of it. So oh, one good. of the guests we're having in the film... Oh yes, let's talk is Chris, is, is Chris Weston, mm. um, who's David Attenborough, one of David Attenborough's favourite sound engineers, who's coming down, he, he's, he founded Cabaret Voltaire as well. <laughs> Um, and he's coming down with his magical box of tricks, his sound of tricks, his, his incredible microphones. And we're going to film him, we're going to film him literally recording that extraordinary unique sound, that rumble. As I said, we, we, we entirely make you a fetish of it because why can't you? You know, why shouldn't you? Of you can't you tell the Scala story Absolutely. without the tube trains. Let's drop some more names. I'm not the only person in this film, am I? No, David, sadly not, although we would have loved it if they were, you know, you'd just come again and again and it was just you. Because I have to say, David was fantastic. No, you don't, I mean, every word out of his mouth was gold. You don't, you don't have to say that, but thank you very much indeed. Uh, let's talk about some people more famous than me, please. If that's even possible, mm. I don't know. Uh, maybe John Waters? What? Je John Waters is coming up. I mean, it's, it's, I'm a bit superstitious because we haven't shot yeah. him yet. We have sh we're shooting John Waters. What a fantastic thing to say mm. that is. Um, but that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Are you going to do this virtually, or is he coming over to the UK? We're going to do it remotely by cameras. The people uh, we have had on the Scala, though, include people yes. like uh, Barry Adamson, the, the well-known uh, musician, Nick Cave's bassist, among other things, of mm -hmm. course, incredible musician in his own right. Uh, we've had Stuart Lee, the comedian, Adam Buxton, and we've had James O'Brien from LBC. Uh, we're getting Mary Harron, uh, the, the director of American Psycho. Um, 
Goodness me, so many names. A lot of these um, uh, directors are, are people who came to the Scala and then became directors subsequently. Absolutely. Um, you've, you've left out one famous name. Now, uh, is he likely to be in the film? His latest film is called Tenet. So Christopher Nolan uh, famously carries mm. the Scala membership um, and card uh, in his wallet to this day. And he still you, has his. I still have mine, and it is right here. That, that wasn't a very subtle cue, was it? I should have done that more seamlessly. Yes, it's right here. But the, <laughs> there you go. This is what it looked that's like. My, oh. That's my Scarlet membership. And you can see the date yes. is the 8th of May, 1993. Now, it closed in 93. Oh. So that would have been my the last, last membership. One. Yeah, my last membership card. Is Christopher Nolan likely to be in your film? No, he's not. He he's too busy. Oh. Is, is, is the harsh truth of that. But it's okay. It's okay. We've got, You've we've got, got so many people. people. We've got so many people. I mean, it's going to... Ideally, this would have been a miniseries, really. Uh, you know, when can we expect to see this film, Ali? Do you know, I think... Roughly. Roughly, I think probably... Uh, what do they say in business? Q2, don't they? They say sort of Q2 or Q3 in terms of years. I reckon probably sort of summer, late summer next year, something like that. Oh, it'll fly by. I hope so. I, I really do hope that festivals, open air festivals, uh, are allowed back then. We haven't all gone down into horrible lockdown because no one knows what they're doing. We just can't tell at the moment. We've got to take a break at, uh, at this point because uh, we like to check up on what our friends at Peccadillo are doing and we have a, a trailer for uh, a Peccadillo release. It's called In Between and this is about Palestinian women in Tel Aviv. Have a look at this and then please join us again in a couple of minutes. دكتور يجي خطيب لهون المساء؟ أه... حبيبتي وين شايفة شالة للحرين فقط؟ جيبي من ما بدك وعليكم السلام صرت تلافير؟ أهلك بعرفوا من فلسطين سلمى هذا وسام خطيب مرحبا وإيش بصير إذا أنا باكل اللي بدي إياه وبلبس اللي بدي إياه كمان؟ بتفكر حالك عايشة في أوروبا؟ زمان ما حسيتش قلبي الحمد لله ها الحمد لله شو ها؟ زيهن فاجرات we come to you in a peaceful demonstration. Uh, that's called In Between, and uh, that's a new. Peccadillo release. Actually, now I come to think of it, it's not that new. Um, uh, the director made that in 2016 and she's never made another film, which is surprising because that got such good reviews. This is David McGillivray here. I'm uh, here on Little Do You Know, you know with Ali Catterall. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, previously we have been uh, discussing uh, the Scala Cinema. And we made just the uh, merest reference um, to the fact that uh, I asked about Ali's name. Now, earlier this year, in February, to be precise, you wrote on social media, this is one of the wildest days of my life. What were you referring to? After 51 years, I had discovered uh, my biological maker, father, if you like, um, technically, and two sisters. Mm. Um, and it was like something out of Kafka. I mean, I've got to be an only child and woke yeah. up a sibling. Mm. That's quite a... Can I swear on this thing? I believe, I believe it is allowed. It's, it's quite a fucking head fuck, <laughs> uh, is, is the most succinct way of putting it. 
Uh, we're going to have to uh, tell the story that led up to this uh, remarkable um, discovery. So um, let's go back, well, in fact, to uh, before uh, the beginning, because your uh, mother, Nina, met an Iraqi student. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. She met him while she was literally 36 hours off the boat from New Zealand, or mm -hmm. had gone travelling from New Zealand, a, back then a stifling small town environment back in the late 60s. Um, and she met a young Iraqi student at Speaker's Corner, fittingly enough, for what I turned into, ah. um, while they were listening to an anarchist talking about draping the trees with paper chains. He was a nice kind of anarchist. And uh, they got chatting, and he took her back to his place in Highbury, and she thinks that I was probably conceived that very night. Was it a one-night stand? It was a free love hit and run. Oh. It was a it was a hippie shag, essentially. I think they drifted together for about sort of, you know, it was 69 was kind of a year of sort of easy riding, of kind of, yes. sort of pitching up and passing through. And, you know, they, 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 you know, drifted along for about three or four months and then drifted apart. She didn't even know she was pregnant till she was sort of seven, seven months in or something. And then I was born a month premature. So her experience of pregnancy was extremely short lived. By the, by the time you were born, um, the aforementioned Iraqi student had, um, um, what, what should we say, packed his bags. He'd, he'd, he'd bug it off. I mean, he, <laughs> he, he came back to see me, I think, in my incubator, just to, just oh. to say, all right, um, and then bug it off again. What did your mother tell you about him when you were growing she up? She said he was a very nice man and to oh. hold zero blame to him because, you know, I wasn't wanted at the time. I was a, you know, I was a little bastard like everyone was those days. And... Uh, it, he wasn't really, you know, there, there was not an atom of blame or resentment on my part for him. That's nice. That's nice. Uh, yeah. this, this comes back. This is why he wrote a book about kindness, I think, because he's a very, he's a very kind man. Um, you were brought up in London's Chelsea area. Um, it, it's it's quite posh, and you. Oh, I think you were on the wrong side of the tracks, actually. Chelsea is uh, the most, or Kensington Chelsea is the most diverse borough mm. in London. I mean, it, it could be like impossibly to somewhere like Islington in this respect, mm. which it's extremely cheap by jowl. Chelsea, people get the wrong idea about people. You know, as soon as you, when I was growing up, people say, "Where are you from?" I'd say Chelsea, Ooh, yeah. and immediately out come the Lady Bracknell impersonation. <laughs> it's it's not like that at all. I was brought up in a place near the World's End, opposite the Lotsbury Panel Station, which back then, and you know, particularly in the early seventies, was a grim working class area filled with gangsters and acid casualties. Oh, you had some infamous neighbours. Can you drop some names? Oh goodness me! I mean, in slightly different timelines, like that too different. Uh, we had Marianne Faithful uh, strung out in heroin at the end of our road and we had... Uh, <laughs> that one shouldn't laugh. No, and we had, um, uh, of course, we had Keeler recovering from uh, a scandal or two this in, the over having, in the overhanging World's End flats. Christine Keeler, yeah, she brought down the Conservative government. Well, her and her friend Mandy... And uh, uh, well, we, you would say that, wouldn't you? Honestly, ah, now that is a direct reference to what she said in court um, uh, with regard to Lord Astor. Um, you'll have to look all that up on Google. Um, you also started hanging out with punks. Uh, well, I mean, I was only sort of six or seven at the time. Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I was born in nineteen seventy, so my experience of punk rock down there which was this was very much the epicenter of, of, of punk because it, vivian westwood shot sex or seditionaries whatever mclaren was calling it that week mm. was about 10 minutes down the road so i did encounter a lot of punks growing up i wasn't necessarily friends with them because i was too young really but i did once remember asking my mum mummy why does that man have his trousers taped together mm. and is he going to fall over so that that was kind of my experience of it's that. the sort of thing i asked myself as well and i just happened to have got um a book here did you ever meet this punk let's get the reflections out of it yes it's jordan i never met jordan oh. but, but i but i could well have done if i'd have walked into that shop age seven for mm. whatever bizarre reason which, you know, had T-shirts of men, men with their dicks out. True. Uh, <laughs> quite why I would have... Maybe I would have mistaken it for the newsagent next door. There was quite a good sweet shop next door to sex where I used to get my licorice all sorts. And I'm sure quite a few punks did as well. 
Well, well, Jordan uh, uh, wrote her autobiography um, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Defying Gravity, and my friend Alan Jones is in it all the way through. And uh, I only mention that because um, he's my guest next week. Oh, wonderful! Um, you We've know, had him as well. You, we you've had him on on the fir- in, the, in film. the film. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. Well, I'm meeting him next week, and this will no doubt come up in a discussion. Um, you went to college, as you described earlier, and I think you were quite excited by the fact that this is where you met one of the people who was involved in a very famous demonstration at the Royal Albert Hall. Yes, he was the son of one of the founders, or the main founder of the of a group called the Angry Brigade, um, which was a... Uh, terrorist or a homegrown terrorist organization which is quite unusual mm. i suppose um who then were how would you describe them david you, you, this is possibly something you know about no, so I'm, the Nazis, I'm afraid it's my era the yes and cyniclus, i don't know but <laughs> yes. they, they used to plant bombs and then tell people they'd plant bombs so they could get out of the way mm. um yes that that king this was at kingsway which was as i said quite a quite a happening political place uh, i think i personally i was as I said, indebted to the spirit of its alumni, the Sex Pistols, and was carrying on like they were. This was at the time I discovered the Scala. The Scala at the time was quite a a, a, a sanctuary for me because I had an extremely brutal home life. Ah, I'm, now, yes, we are going to come back to that. First of all, just tell us what happened at the Albert Hall. The Albert Hall, that was when Bob Hope mm-hmm. was egged um, by feminists. During? During Miss World, Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. There's a film made about this later, actually. There was. It opened just before the first lockdown and then uh, closed again. But uh, it, I was very it surprised to see one of my friend's mums in it, who oh. actually stars as a character in the film. And right at the end, she appears as herself. And I thought, hang on, that's uh, that's my friend's mum. Goodness mm. me. So that was, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, you just mentioned a uh, 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 home life there. So uh, your mum took up with uh, somebody we're calling Neil and it didn't end well, did it? No, uh, but we'll call him that because that's actually his name. He's dead now, so oh. I don't mind. Mm-hmm. Um, Nina isn't her name either, but we're mm. saying that so there's no jigsaw identification here. Okay. Um, yes, he was a, he was a practising Crowleyite, a sociopathic practising Crowleyite. Um, this is regularly, Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley, who regularly practiced black magic under mm. my startled nose and inveigled me into various supernatural happenings. We were... Give me one example um, of his magic with a K. Mm. Uh, I can tell you that he made a pub disappear before my eyes while I was standing in it. For all I know, this could have been an extraordinary act of Darren Browner's hypnosis. It's not important for me whether or not you believe that I was literally exposed to the occult or the supernatural, not only that you understand that I was completely inculcated in this framework of belief that affected our every sort of move and action and thought. Um, as I said, yes, a sociopathic uh, warlock, if you like, that I grew up with. We grew up below the poverty line. Uh, there was no hot water in the house. Um, I was exhausted at school a lot of the time because I'd be falling asleep in lessons um, because I was so tired and and we were poor. It's, it's, it's an aspect of poverty. If you think I have a middle class accent, I can dissuade you from this immediately. The reason why, um, and I'm certainly, I wouldn't call myself necessarily middle class. I think we were living slightly below that. You're slightly apart from that spectrum, the whole sort of working class. We were what you'd call sort of poor with books um, or sort of arts and crafts. It was very boho. It was genuinely boho. But like a lot of boho families, scratch the surface of that. And often, very often, you'll find some quite unpleasant things. If you're living within a bubble, extremely alternative bubble, very often normality or, let's say, balance doesn't really seep in there very much. So unfortunately, a lot of terrible things happen. Uh, Neil wasn't a very pleasant man. What became of him? Uh, well, thankfully, he died uh, eventually. Um, that was that was very hard on me because he was estranged by that point. He would around about sort of 1993, he had an affair a love triangle, an unwitting love triangle for me, uh, with my first girlfriend. Um, I discovered it. He threatened to kill me oh. uh, physically or with black magic, one of the two. He would be threatening me with black magic throughout my life. I mean, I, I come from serious abuse. Um, and he would threaten to kill my friends and me with, with curses and that sort of thing. 
Um, and you believed this? I, absolutely, 100%. I mean, when I was 15, I'd be shouting at strangers in the street that I knew who they were and stopped following me because he told me he was a spy for MI6 and he would have people following me. He would also say that if I ever told anyone he was a spy, he was also Jesus Christ and the devil. It was a very Manson-like setup, Charles Manson-like setup. But he would tell me that if I ever told anyone that he would have me killed and the whole family killed. This is classic abuse, um, isn't it's, it? It's, isn't it, Craig? It's the whole, it's the whole, uh, it's the whole <laughs> smorgasbord. Um, what so, ev this? so eventually, you know, when I found out he had an affair with my, my girlfriend, I had to go to an AIDS clinic to find out whether he'd, my stepfather had given me AIDS because he was also stopping half of Chelsea at the time. Oh. Um, yeah, that's probably the lowest point, I imagine. So then he eventually hung around uh, for a bit longer, then, then buggered off. Um, but he, we were estranged from him when he died, uh, luckily. But unfortunately, when your abuser dies, and any abused person whose abuser has died will recognise this, it's really a psychology 101. You have to work out who the hell you are. Mm. Yeah. Because if they've shaped you, if the, when the monster dies, part of you has gone with that, and you have to work out who the heck you are. I had a very bad 2018 where essentially I tried uh, to sort of eat and drink myself to death, really. Uh, sort of Le Grand Bouffe style, I suppose. It's not like something out of Bunuel, I thought. I'd, it'll be painless, obviously. That sort of thing isn't painless, and I don't really recommend it. This was a kind of breakdown. It was, essentially, yes. Um, and then at the beginning of 2020, um, just before this mysterious virus that we are hearing about infecting whole cruise liners had started to poke its head around the corner, I thought, I can't, I really can't do this anymore. I was, I was out with a mate in a pub, fell over in King's Cross, just by the Scala, coincidentally enough, grazed my knee in front of a, of, a, of a homeless guy who laughed uproariously. And I thought, I've really, this is my nadir. I can't, I can't do this anymore. Um, I'd found out I had diabetes type 2 by that stage, of course. Um, Caused by the overeating? Co yes, absolutely. Mm. Um, and I thought, I've got to do something about this. And so I lost four stone in three months and cured cured or reversed my diabetes good um i put on a stone of course since then as well through through filmmaking which is astonishingly stressful yes um because filmmaking tends to seep into every hairline crack of your existence you'll know this david as a filmmaker yourself it's an extraordinarily extreme thing to do oh but it's lovely as well it's though amazing. yes it is amazing let's Let me, i don't want to put anyone off here it's incredible no, no. it's just the highs of beyond anything you've ever experienced i can understand why people go bankrupt and lose their family over this mm. but the lows swing several levels below dante i mean it's it's, it's, it's extreme you know it, it certainly is let's go back in time just a few years because uh, you tell me how it happened. In 2007, you were able to phone your biological father. Yes, I saw his name, the, the name associated with him, my mother had given me, and um, I called him up, and or the man bearing his name, and he, and I, like some sort of terrible clod-hopping Sherlock Holmes, I said, are you this person? Did you know this woman? Yada, yada. And he said, if you don't hang up now, I'm going to call the police. Um, I was a bit crushed by that, and for about 10 years after that, I decided I wanted no more searching. You know, that was such a horrific experience. Because you didn't know why he'd said it. I didn't know why he'd said it, and I didn't know I was actually then, I didn't know 100%, I was talking to the mm. very guy. I was actually talking to my father. So let's now flash forward again to this year. Hmm. And this is where Jane Giles comes up again. Jane Giles, as I said, has changed my life in four significant ways. The first time she programmed my head and set me the most extraordinary films when she was a programmer mm. and set me off in this life of film criticism for 20 years. You um, wrote for The Guardian. I wrote, I'm a TV reviewer for The Guardian still to this day. Um, mm. But then I was writing places like sort of Empire and Hot Dog and Word and Film 4 for a long time. Um, she changed my life a second time by inviting me in to edit her astonishing award-winning book. Um, she changed my life a third time by inviting me to code. She's quite a wonderful woman, Jane. Let me have, let me show you a picture of Jane. Yes. This is Jane Giles outside the courtroom during the Clockwork Orange scandal. Isn't she magnificent? <laughs> How magnificent is she? What was your first impression of Jane Giles when you met her? Force of nature. Uh, I think true. anyone who knows her will say force true. of nature. True. The third time she changed my life was when she invited me to co-direct 
this movie, obviously. The fourth time was when she said, so, uh, you want help finding your, uh, your family, do you? And I said, I, I suppose, yeah. Um, <laughs> ten minutes later, she mm. said, well, I found your sister. Next. <laughs> How did she do it? Uh, she did it through a combination of LinkedIn and Companies House and Facebook. There was a kind of tripart thing to this in which she sort of cross-referenced, um, you know, names and dates and also faces as well, because I look um, astonishingly like uh, him. Mm -hmm. I look astonishingly like my baby sister. I look a little bit like the woman the elder sister that Jane initially contacted. But that was enough to go on. At that point, I still hadn't seen what he looked like, mm. and I still hadn't seen what my baby sister looked like. If I had, we would have known 100%. There'd been even no need for a paternity test. You've now met your sisters. Yeah. How did you get on? <laughs> I love them. They're, they're amazing. They, they, yeah, I'm going to get a bit emotional now, but they... You can, <laughs> because this is an extraordinary need, drink, situation, that. please. It's, I, and you've you got know. you've got something in common as well. This is remarkable, isn't it? Music. My uh, my baby sister is uh, is a is a music teacher. Yeah, and she's um, she plays piano like I do. Um, and there was a, there was an artistic scene running through the whole running through the siblings. Anyway, I would say my um, my biological maker. I still don't really. I, f I still find it very hard at this point, from the vantage point of July 2021, I still find it quite hard to call in the D or F word because I, semantically, I think words, as a writer, I think words are very important and have particular kind of meanings. And I can't really call in the D word because he never was. Mm. Even the F word is quite bizarre to me. Um, so I'll call in my maker for now. It, things will undoubtedly change in time. If you're watching this in 20 years time. <laughs> <laughs> this will be... If uh, you're watching this in 20 years time, you'll wonder what on earth this is and what's going on. So apologies, and I hope the, the hover packs are okay and not playing up. <laughs> as far as I know, this will be around uh, until the crack of doom. Now, you, you, you did say on the... Uh, we'll, we'll just deal with this briefly, Ali, because we're, we're coming to the end of the show. But you did say briefly on the 17th of July, this could be my most momentous day. So what do you want to tell me about that? Um, goodness me, yes, I I met him. Is that is that what you were That's talking good about? Enough. There have been so many momentous things in the last yeah. six months, I don't know whether I'm coming or going. It's that one. Um, it's, it, yes, it was... Um, life life is not a fairy tale and life does not have fairy tale endings. Also, I, I, I firmly now believe there's no such thing as closure there is simply more processing. Um, life is messy and complicated, and life, most importantly, takes time. Uh, now, as an only child, or former only child, as I said, like something out of Kafka who woke up and became a sibling, I'm used to immediacy because there's no siblings to sort of filter through. So I'm used to sprints, not marathons. That's one of the reasons I was able to cure my diabetes so quickly, because I put my fucking foot down on the gas. And that's how I've lived my entire life. You know, on my gravestone, it will probably say at least it was never boring. You know, yeah. I can't think of anything worse than, a, than dullness. Um, so I will say that it is still a learning. And if I can be drippy about this healing process, it will take time. And uh, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing what the future brings. But right now, you have got two sisters you're very fond of. That's the sort of thing we ought to stress. So what would you advise people who are in the position of possibly finding a family they never knew they had? Should they go further or should they just let things lie? It depends how curious you are and whether you are capable of letting these things run one day at a time and seeing where it takes you. I would, from my point of view, I would certainly recommend it if you can, um, because otherwise you will always have that bit of the jigsaw puzzle missing. I found the missing bit of the jigsaw puzzle, but right now it's a blank. The jigsaw puzzle is a blank. It needs filling in more, if you if you can follow this metaphor. Um, I'm, I'm glad I did it, and I'm glad that I can die knowing who he is and who they are and who my family are. Um, but I would stress 
hugely, I would stress this, take one day at a time and be patient because life takes time. But on the whole, you're glad you did it. Yeah. A remarkable story. There's, there's more coming up, um, but uh, alas, not here because uh, uh, the clock has um, beaten us, even though I have, in fact, removed the clock because it ticks so loudly in this room. Ali, we have to say <laughs> goodbye. Thank you so much for joining me in uh, uh, West London today. And I will Thank get you. you another glass of wine, I, pr I promise what, you. Please tell, please tell the viewers what this is, because I want to know, because it's fantastic. Oh, well, that's, uh, that's Sancerre. And, and, and thereby hangs a tale, because, you know, I've been clearing out somebody's house, and he was a wine writer, and it was all going to end up in the skip. I mean, no way was that happening. <laughs> well, I'm glad it's ending up in us. We're, um, we're paying tribute here to uh, uh, Richard Kane because it was his collection. Join me again uh, n n at the same time next week, if you would, because as I mentioned earlier, my guest will be Alan Jones. He's one of the programmers of Fright Fest, uh, the UK's leading horror film festival. And as far as we know, today it is going to be a real festival and not a virtual one, which it was last year. So um, Alan will be able to tell us which films to watch out for. Join me then. Until then, from my guest, Ali Catterall, and me, David McGillivray. Mwah! Bye. <laughs>